We conclude this series on uh, the throne room, and uh, then we have some question and answer. We have promised that at the end of every series, we open for questions and answers uh, in line with those uh, series. Um, this morning, I talk about secrets uh, in remaining the throne room, and we managed to cover two points. One of them is Christ consciousness. And the second point is that uh, thoughts are movement even in the throne room. Uh, now, so just to reprise about Christ consciousness, uh, let's look at uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 1 first. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, that's where God has placed us uh, in His uh, throne room. It tells us here, let's read from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without, him, uh, without blame before Him in love. Everything proceeds from the throne room. Life, energy, light, and everything else uh, is where creation came forth. It's God who spoke and all creation came forth. And the throne room continues to be the center of the universe. There is a center of the universe. It is a throne room. Understanding the effects and the power that is inherent in the throne room, we realize that indeed every blessing proceeds from the throne room. Every blessing proceeds from the heavenly places. It is good for us to know that your blessings does not come from the east or from the west. Your blessings come from God. Promotion does not come from the east or the west. It comes from God. No doubt God may use different instruments in the natural, but if you lose sight of the fact that behind everything natural, behind your company, behind your business, behind any natural thing by which the resources uh, have been harvested, in which your blessings came, be, uh, behind every trading and buying, and all the various things that produce the natural wealth of this earth, all the other forms of wealth, like ideas, and uh, all the other love, goodness, and mercy, all these things are only instruments. The real blessing behind it is from God Himself. If we cannot see the connection with God, we have become disconnected. And blessed are those who can see that their ultimate, ultimate source of all their blessings is from God Himself, the heavenly place. Thus, when we access the throne room, remember, you're accessing the very source of life itself. Your life came from the throne room. It is Him that breathed life out. And we have shared in this throne room series how the life flow out was through the worship and praise in a throne room. Each time that uh, in visions I saw that each time that the, the four creatures say, Holy, holy, holy is a lot of hosts, there's another wave of light that flows out through the universe. It all continues to proceed from that. It is like the heartbeat of the universe is the heartbeat of praise and worship. But our heart beats and pumps blood all over our organs and tissues. The heartbeat of the universe is from the throne room. And each time there's a praise and worship, it's like another wave and another wave and another wave of life that keeps flowing forth to wherever they would receive the life of God. Of course, we are in a fallen section which doesn't feel it that much, but it's still there. Life of God that flows forth. And, uh, so notice that everything is blessed us in the heavenly places, in verse 3, but if you stop at the place, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, full stop. You've got a wrong full stop. Heavenly places in Christ. So it's the consciousness of Christ that brings you into the throne room. It's the consciousness of Christ that keeps you there. It's the consciousness of Christ that maintains it and empowers it and increases it. That is the constant theme in the book of Ephesians. When you look at chapter 2, even talking about redemption, it says there in uh, verse 4 onwards, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, 
and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come and that includes Paul time, include our time, and include the future that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us again you have the words in Christ Jesus we were raised together up with Christ we are seated in heavenly places again in verse 6 in Christ Jesus and we are blessed in his kindness and his mercy in Christ Jesus you take the word in Christ Jesus out and the whole thing falls down our consciousness of Christ is very important now, what does it mean to be conscious of Christ there are several people that are in practical ways that have practiced the consciousness of Christ um, I forgot this author's name but uh, he wrote the book uh, prayer the greatest force on earth uh, he has gone home to be a lot already and in his book he talked about how he practiced in his mind uh, when he is not doing anything let's say when he's traveling on a train or, uh, or doing mundane things that don't need the exercise of the mind or mental thinking his mind will just repeat the words Jesus 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 even that small little thing in his book he talked about how powerful it was but that's only part of what being conscious of Christ is it's not just the sounds of the name of Jesus being repeated constantly. For him, in that book, um, it produced a very powerful effect. So great that he wrote a whole book about the importance of prayer, importance of uh, the name of Jesus constantly resounding in your consciousness. That's one of the methods. There are other methods that involve, which are more closer to the biblical point of view. For example, like Ephesians chapter 5, you all know the verse, so I won't turn to that. It was 18 and 19. It says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourself. It says, Do not be drunk in wine first. Then it says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. Now, notice the word, singing and making melody in your heart. That melody is Christ consciousness. It's the melody that is produced through the feeling of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, one of the first things that God enables us to do is to worship Him. It is prophesied in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 that Christ Himself will worship in us, through us. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 that He will sing praises in the midst of us. Quoting from the Old Testament in the book of Hebrews 1. And, and the word Him and he refers to God the Father and Christ. So what the Holy Spirit does is he implants something of the nature of Christ. What was it like when Jesus was alive on this earth for 33 years? What was his mental state? What was his consciousness? Part of it was He's always thinking about the Father. He's always thinking about the will of the Father. But there's another part of it. He's actually always worshipping. And we know that from John chapter 4. He says to the woman at the well, You worship what you do not know. The Jews worship in Jerusalem. The Samaritans, the Samaritans worship here. But the day will come when they will worship me in spirit and in truth. And Jesus, if He tells us to worship God in spirit and in truth, and He prophesied of a time that people will worship truly in spirit. Now remember He was talking to the woman of well in John chapter 4. Old Testament worship was based on a regular cycle. They have the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, they have their festivities, their, fest, uh, their feasts, their seven feasts. Uh, one of them actually is the fast, the day of atonement. And then they have the regular times that they come to the temple for various, various occasions, personal requests and everything, sin offering and uh, uh, trespass offering and uh, thanksgiving offering, all kinds of offering they, they bring. So they have these festivities, but it was located in one place, specified certain times of the calendar with some regularity every, every day. When the Samaritans started 
they, they started something away from Jerusalem, and so they carry on the tradition. Jesus says, both are done away with. Both are done away with. And the day has come, and he prophesied the day that it was coming, and that's the day when the Holy Spirit came. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes, and the main purpose, if you think about it, what's the purpose of God giving us the ability to speak in tongues? The purpose? <laughs> Excuse me. It wakes everybody up. Uh, the purpose? To intercede? That will be your answer. But that's not the only purpose. He gave us the ability to sing in the Spirit. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 and 15. And remember the first time the Holy Spirit came out of, in Acts chapter 2? They heard them speak the works of God. If they were worshipping all the works and the majesty of God. All to do with worship. And between prayer and worship, which is greater? Thank you very much. Prayer count is born out of need. Prayer is born out of consciousness of need. I didn't say it's wrong. There's a place for that. Whenever we sense a need, sense a burden, sense something that is not in the perfect way of God, we sense something that is not perfect, when we sense something that is not like what heaven should be, prayer comes. It is good. It is necessary. There's a place for that on the earth. Because all things are not perfected yet. But at the end of all prayer, we are taught in the book of Philippians, give thanks. Even in prayer we are taught to give thanks. And then there is worship. What we are bringing forth to you. The greater will always include the lesser. The lesser cannot remain in itself if it is to succeed. In other words, no prayer will break through if you never pray into thanksgiving. No prayer will break through if you never pray into worship. You know why? Because you're so conscious of your problems and needs that you never come out of it. And we all know, some of us have been Christians for long enough to know, we have met people and sometimes we ourselves have experienced unanswered prayer. And you ask the question, what is the reason for unanswered prayer? What's the cause of unanswered prayer? Some people die without their prayers being answered. And they weep, they cry, and it looks like heaven was silent because they never worship. Of course, the other reason could be they pray wrongly, like the poor James said. But here's the thing. Even if you pray wrongly and you worship, you will in the end discover you pray wrongly and then pray rightly. But if you pray wrongly all the time, you will never discover it. Whatever we do, it must end in worship. So if worship is the greater thing, why not start here? And true enough, in Christian history, and I'm always interested in Christian history, once in a while, some men and women of God discover something. So there was this guy who discovered, there are a lot of Christians who discover the power of prayer and all those things. There are a lot of very good books on it. So they discover those principles. But there's this Christian who discovered a few of them, in fact. And one of them who is more famous uh, is Merlin Carotas. He wrote the book, Prison to Praise. And then he wrote many other books. And he discovered his whole life is just one principle. He learned to praise God in everything. That's all. And just that one principle brought him very far. But the thing about the kingdom of God, you cannot just base on one principle. You've got to have all the doctrines of the kingdom of God. But what I want to show is, even the one thing he discovered brought him quite far. Prison to praise. And he wrote lots of books. It was one of the best-selling charismatic books in the charismatic days. Prison to pray. And a lot of Christians' mindset will change. Instead of complaining, they started praising God. Instead of grumbling, they started praising God. And when they did, 
there were healings, there were different things, a lot of things change, take place. Because the greater will always pull the lesser. So when we look at that and we say, all right, when God gave us the ability to speak in tongues, there is speaking in tongues, there is, uh, there is, there is uh, prayer in tongues, there is singing in tongues, which is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 and 15. Paul says, I will pray with my spirit, I will pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, I will sing with my understanding. So there you include it, singing in the spirit. And then you have verses like Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19 about melody in the heart. You have verses like Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of God dwell richly in you, speaking in some things and spiritual songs. Everything seems to lead to praise and worship. And here's the wonderful, wonderful thing about the New Testament. The New Testament is full of praise and worship. And you know why? Because God has completed His part. When something is completed, there's nothing else to do. The finished work of Christ and the doctrine of the finished work of Christ implies that we have to learn how to give thanks. To tap on the finished work of Christ. Which is why every New Testament book is written with give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, thanksgiving. He said, I give thanks for this, I give thanks for that. Always giving thanks. Why? More emphasis than the Old Testament. We have the completed work of Christ when Jesus says it's finished. All these points to one thing praise and worship. So, the first principle in talking about the consciousness of Christ is that God actually put the consciousness of Christ in us by putting into us praise and worship. Because in the morning, when I cover the point, the first point is being conscious of Christ. Many people might go back and thinking how to be conscious of Christ. And then here's what that happened. You know, we humans go to tell us that we try to be conscious of Christ. And which is not conscious. Trying to be conscious of Christ is being conscious of you trying to be conscious of Christ. <laughs> and uh, so you're conscious that you're consciously trying to be conscious of Christ. <laughs> which is not Christ Consciousness. So, how do we do it? Just worship. Just worship. When you have a heart of worship, consciousness of Christ comes with it. And so God placed it in us when He put melodies in our heart. Being filled with the Spirit includes being filled with the melodies of the Spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 18 and 19. You may not be aware of it and we have not. I wish as a young Christian that they had taught me that when I was born again, God made your heart sick. Because most of us come to God with a very sad heart. Why we have been burdened by sin? And the only songs we sing is, you know, Nobody knows the trouble I have been or, or swing love, sweet chariot, come and carry me home. And please, faster before I die here. Right. And so, always sad songs. Uh, and, um, nothing wrong with that. At least those were those days when the slaves were singing it in order to encourage themselves. But it's still not worship yet. It's what I call a testimonial song. Worship is not just singing about us. There are songs that sing about us. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. But worship is just being in His presence and adoring Him. Just adoring Him. It's hard to describe. It's just like trying to describe love. How do you love a person? You can list a thousand and one ways. But the way in itself is not necessarily love. You can do the thousand and one things and yet it might not be love. But yet love includes all those things. The same way. Worship is just heart to heart adoration with God. And the closest the Bible gives us is that when you and I were born again, He makes your heart sing. So along with point one, consciousness of Christ, is 
consciousness of the worship that God has already put in your heart. You're not even trying. You just let this flow of worship that is inside you come out from you. Jesus has already put the spirit of worship into us. He knows we are so incapable. We don't even know how to worship Him. So He puts a spirit of worship to worship Him. That brings the consciousness of Christ. So forget about trying to be conscious or being conscious of Christ. And then, then you go one more step. Now that you know you have to be conscious to be conscious of Christ, you're trying to be conscious of the fact that you're not conscious, that you're conscious or conscious of Christ. <laughs> so, all kinds of things. And you get messed up somewhere down there. Just worship. Just adore Him. It might be silent. It might be spoken. It might be heart to heart. But that's it. And why I thought that principle is this. Because some of you are getting downloads and visions. And your type of visions is not like what I call the visions that come from uh, energizing from the outside, from the Holy Spirit. Those are from the gifts. But most of your visions that were training come from your inward man, your spirit, which is energizing from your inside. And when you energize from your inside, when you're seeing an inner vision, and you see, which is closer to your imagination, and, but not your imagination because it comes from the Holy Spirit. Like your imagination, but not your imagination. Some of you might find it hard, especially if you've never heard this kind of teaching before. But let me comfort you from the Christian point of view. Right? All Christians have thoughts. You have thoughts. If you are alive, you have thoughts right now. You think before you exist. You are. Some of your thoughts are from your own. Everybody say. Of course there are some of your thoughts are from your own. Why do you think all your thoughts came from the durian or somebody else like whatever? Right. Some of your thoughts occasionally come from the devil in the world. Okay, thank you if you ask something. The rest of you never thought your heart, you have never repented from your entire life. Okay. So if you ever were tempted, you would have some thoughts that come to you. Those are not your thoughts. Those are temptation thoughts. Then some of your thoughts came from God. The Bible to show you. The Holy Spirit brings remembrance of the things that Jesus has spoken. So there's an inner process of thoughts that come from God. So even in the thought dimension, you got this three. The key is to differentiate the thoughts that come from God. From your own thoughts, from the enemies. And to constantly understand which one comes from you. Which the Word of God helps to identify. Because Jesus told in the Gospel of John chapter 14, 15, 16, when he talked about Holy Spirit coming, he says, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things that Jesus has spoken. So the act of bringing the remembrance is a thought process. And then, that is one verse, one section of words. Another section in 1 Corinthians 2, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 2, it says, we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> of course, having the mind of Christ would include the thoughts of Christ. Some of the thoughts of Christ would come to you. Right, that settles it. Now come to the other side. Your imagination is a part of you. Because some of you might have not used your imagination for a long, long time. All rusty, cobwebs, you know. And, uh, and it looks like no more imagination. Yeah. It died when you came from childhood into adulthood. And uh, so, except there was no funeral service, so you didn't know he died. <laughs> and, uh, so, we all were born with imagination. Here's the thing. Some of your imaginations came from you. Some of your imaginations came from the enemy. Occasionally. Some imaginations come from the Lord. Can you see the logic of that? When God makes us human, we, were, we had a built-in system by which God could use. But through all the years of living in sin and not being taught properly, we were not taught how to tune in when God speaks. We expect when God speaks, that every time when God speaks, the earth will shake. The winds will blow. The clouds will thunder. The lightning will show. Angels will sing. And 
Then there was a booming, usually bass voice of God saying, I am now speaking, whatever. So we got all these things messed up. That is spectacular. It might be outside. God might do all those things or send an angel, give a vision, appear to you. We forgot that the most mundane things of human life contain the spiritual. That God is speaking through your thoughts. That God is speaking in your imagination. And we already do a whole study in the Bible. The word yet, imagination in Hebrew is the word yetzer. We have a whole series on yetzer in, in, in our series. Where the word uh, imagination is also translated as uh, dianoia. In uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, 18, 19, the eyes of your dianoia, which include imagination. And every time when the Bible talks about the, the word mind, when it talks about the heart, especially in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, it uses the word dianoia. Remember, dianoia has eyes which means it's visual. It's a visual part of your mind. Visual part of your mind, imagination. And so, God does speak in the imagination. I didn't say that all your imaginations are from God, because some are just your imagination. So don't say, just say the Lord, I saw this cartoon figure came to me. <laughs> Where got Bible words? You know? Don't care, even if a Mickey Mouse says, and quotes the Bible, that's not... <laughs> not, not the Lord. That's some other imagination. You got everything mixed up. Right. All right now. So, the thing is, we need to differentiate when it comes from God. And that's why in this training, we've been training people to recognize when the thoughts come from God. To recognize when the imagination comes from God. And from that tiny little place, we could train and develop so that your imagination can become the corridor or the language which God speaks to you. And people like Arion, whose visions I read this morning, his is from the inside. From the imagination, is grows and learns. All right. So, your imagination is a place for God to train and for the Word to cleanse you. So, based on that, I'm talking about point one, the visions in seeing God that Consciousness of Christ private, uh, primarily is worshipping God. But sometimes you are worship, worshipping God, it is God's imagination coming to you. That was it by spirit. You might think you might be seeing some things, you got flesh, and you thought you saw some angel, you thought you saw light, you thought you saw this. At first it's blur. But then with it comes thoughts. And those thoughts are again three, three areas. Not from yourself, not from the enemy, but they are thoughts from God. Every one of you have received thoughts from God. I'll point to some incidences. When you are privately reading the Bible sometimes, studying or whatever, you sometimes got an inner thought that seems to be explaining the Bible to you. Inspiration. Those are thoughts from God. And those are the still small voice that only you can hear on your inside, which is the voice of God. Learning to differentiate that voice is the skill to be led by the Spirit. And then, occasionally, some of you might see things that you thought, is that my imagination? And all of a sudden, some of it filtered in from the Holy Spirit. And we are teaching at this level where many people have developed their thoughts and their imaginations to be a corridor or a channel which God can speak through. And that's why I'm training those of you who already have started in that area. And when you are talking to God in the corridor of thoughts and imagination, whenever, point one, whenever the worship part of you stops or you become conscious of your problems and all that, you stop seeing. In the early days, like this morning, because I used Arion as an illustration, anyway, Arion gave me permission to use him as an illustration. And, uh, Arion, when he first started in visions, you all met him in Madaba. When he first started, he was like, he, the first thing he saw me, he made an appointment in, in, in Madaba. We had several people that spent an hour each with them. And he lists down about three, four visions. He said, Pastor, is this my own? Then I looked through and said, no, this is good. This part, this part, this part, all from the Lord. And then, then he told me his dream. Dreams part, you notice I didn't reply him and I 
because of the own probably mixed up with the soul, so nothing. But I pointed out which part was from the spirit. Then from there it developed. And among his first visions he saw was Elijah coming to him and talking to him about the Bible times. And he saw a vision of Elijah uh, with the uh, uh, at the brook uh, and the uh, crows coming to feed him. Uh, so he's sitting there. And then a few of these visions, among his early ones, when he saw, he said, hey, this looks like Elijah. This is like Elijah talking to him and enhancing the Bible. Then as he's looking, then slowly the imagination started to fade. And it started to fade, Elijah says, you are fading. <laughs> and still, he said, you are fading. You know? And uh, they seem to know you cannot see them also. And uh, then, a few times after that, because he's actually a full-time working person, I think in the finance, uh, he got bogged down with natural things or whatever. Then he tell me, not much, cannot see much. And it is true. Whenever you're bogged down with the early things, this process stops. Which is why I'm teaching at the level of those of you who understand how to maintain. You must be free from the natural thing. And you always guard the heart of worship. Nothing shakes you from this heart of worship. Whatever you do. And with that, anytime the downloads come, they can come to you. Now I have a type of vision called, uh, it's like an open vision, but I can switch it off and switch it on. And so when, when it becomes, it has come to the level after all the energizing, energizing, energizing is very important. It's going to energize you. And after all the energizing, I started to be able to recognize the difference in the angels and all those things. So it's very funny because when I started being able to become aware of the angels and see them, so I was like reading, and then towards my left, this angel comes and then look at me here like this. You know, like standing from the back and then look at me like that. Then I was reading and my eyes go upward and say, I can see you. But we had just talked in thoughts. Said, I can see you. And then the angels went, Oh, you can see me. So I can see you now. And uh, so it's like they test whether you can see that. And uh, so that was some of the first early encounters. And uh, then I could recognize and describe. I, I have descriptions of all the different angels, what they look like, and all that, and their dialogue, and all those things. Uh, so some of you are beginning to have that. And like I say, you go to your Bible school in heaven. The key in point one to maintain that attitude is Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness. The principle is Christ consciousness. The method is worship. Being in a worshipful heart keeps you there. So whatever goes on in your heart is going to affect you. And then in my point two, I talk about how thoughts are energy. Which means that when you are having a download, any wrong thought that come to you feel very disruptive. Your mind must have a type of rest, I call it uh, a rest. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. From the book of Isaiah. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. So the mind and the thoughts must also be at rest. If your emotions or your thoughts are disruptive, the downloads are going to be very difficult. There has to be a thought of peace and rest. Uh, that is the principle. How you receive and achieve that, there are different methods. Uh, so for that second point, let me point to some scriptures. Uh, let's start with Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Don't forget, I, I haven't forgotten the question and answer. Maybe really. give time for that. Somebody said, hey, I've got question and answer. There will be. Okay. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 tells us that, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice that there are two areas. It guards your heart and it guards your mind. 
You never thought about peace as something powerful enough to guard both heart and mind. But that's the basic uh, teaching that, that the peace of God can indeed guard heart and mind uh, inside you. The word guard actually is like uh, forming a fortress, like a fortress uh, around, around you so that nothing can enter. That's why I say during the time when you're in a throne room, if anything disrupts and your soul is too active and not at rest, you have to enter the rest, then you can feel yourself, even though you're technically in a throne room, you get pulled down to the earth. And you come out of the consciousness of the throne room. So those two principles I thought this morning is to maintain your perspective in a throne room. And, uh, Anyway, the verse that you, uh, I quote, just now quoted was Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, that God will keep your mind in perfect peace. God will keep your mind in perfect peace. Uh, the mind that is stayed on Him, that's from Isaiah 26, uh, verse 3. Let me look at some of the Hebrew words here. Okay, that one doesn't have it there. Sum up, to take hold. The word stay, the mind that stay on him is the word to take hold. Mind that is uh, held by God. And here in Isaiah 26 verse 3, you know the interesting thing is that the word mind is yetza, imagination. So perfect peace must be there and the mind must be at rest at the true root so that God could dialogue with God does want that. So I wanted to complete those two parts uh, in this uh, second service just to tie up what we uh, had started this morning. And then uh, just to add a few little things to show that basically it all comes to the condition of your heart and of your mind. Condition of your heart and your mind for God to relate us. The whole Bible is about heart and mind. There are many verses that say, you know, renew your mind in the Lord. And uh, Romans 8, that when you set your mind on things of the flesh, is, uh, you produce death. On the things of the spirit, you produce life and peace. And uh, from the time of the Old Testament, all the time they're talking about, sometimes their, their mouth worship God, but their heart is far away. And God wants them to have a, the heart of God. In the end, like sometimes they find in David a man after his heart. And uh, then he began to prophesy about time coming in the book of Ezekiel when he will take away the heart stone, give us a heart of flesh. Come to the New Testament, he gives us a new heart. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 that this is the new covenant. He will write his laws in our heart and in our mind. He put his laws in our heart and in our mind. Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, the new covenant. It all has to do with heart and mind, heart and mind, heart and mind. You cannot run away from the fact that heart and mind are important. Do you know that the whole planet was flooded because the heart and mind of the people were not right? Not only their actions were not right, Genesis 6 says, God saw the imagination of their hearts that it was constantly wicked. Their works were wicked and there was more wickedness coming and God judged the world by a flood. The whole Bible story is a story of heart and mind, heart and mind, heart and mind. This is the true thing. I am not talking about physical heart, but it's talking about the heart that is inside us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 verse 8. Nothing to do with the physical heart. The heart has to do with the source of your thoughts and your imaginations. The source of your consciousness. That's where your heart and your mind is. And we, we are finishing off a book called Spiritual Man, Book 2, which is like Part 2, a book to finish off, uh, Watchman Nero, a book of Spiritual Man. So I have a one called Spiritual Man, uh, and Book 2, which continues from his. And uh, so we, would, we describe what is heart, what is mind, and all the divisions, the six divisions that it has, we redefine it. And uh, we take the new things about def defining what the heart is. Kenneth Hagin defined the heart to be the spirit man. And, uh, and uh, then 
uh, Watch Ben Lee defined the heart to be uh, three parts soul and one part spirit in his spiritual man book. Uh, in, include uh, emotions and uh, will and uh, intellect plus the conscience. So he included that part. And we, in, uh, in our, my book too, I mentioned that the heart basically covers all of your inner man. Your spirit and your soul. That's why sometimes the word heart seems to refer to the soul side when it is the bad one. Uh, so the spirit and the soul consist of where your heart is, the true heart. And so everything in this life consists the heart, the mind, the soul, the spirit. The body, we will get a new body when Jesus comes again. But it's the heart and the soul. So I give one illustration and I ask one question. And uh, let's look at the book of uh, Numbers. Let me show a bad guy first. A bad guy. There are many stories, but I will just give a few illustrations and then we move on from that. In the book of Numbers, let's, uh, in the book of Numbers, there's this story of Balaam. So if you have your Bible to the book of Numbers, I gave you the chapter, chapter 22. Number chapter 22. Suddenly, uh, this guy called Balaam. Balaam in the New Testament became a picture of someone who merchandised the anointing. Someone who used a gift of God for money. And uh, so, not a good example. But I got a little question to ask after I read this story. So, there is Balak, who is the bad guy. And he want to fight or rather uh, uh, destroy the Israelites. So he got this bad intention. And in those days, before they do it, they need a seer or someone to pronounce a blessing or a curse. So he wants to hire and pay money to Balaam, who very strangely, Balaam could hear God. He was not listening to the devil. He could hear God. God spoke to him. In fact, when he prophesied, it was a good prophecy in the end that came out. So we know one thing, Balaam could hear God. But whether he was for God, in God, renewed by God, converted by God, that's a different question. He was not. Um, so he sent messengers to Balaam to come and, um, and curse the Israelite. And while all these things are happening, the Israelite doesn't know what was happening. All these things are a different story uh, that's at the sideline. And uh, in verse 7, we are in chapter 22, verse 7, they came to him, and the elders of the Moab, the elders of the Median, departed with the diviners' feet in their hand. They came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Bala. Then Balaam said, Lord, here tonight, I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. See, that's how I know the Lord actually did talk to him. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then verse 9, he says, God came to Balaam. God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippo, king of Moab, sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I might be able to overpower them and drive them out. Then God said, look at what God said in verse 12. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse them. For they are blessed. So in the morning, Balaam got up and says, uh, Go back. The Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. I cannot do what you want me to do. And so in verse 14, the princess rose. They went, they went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. And this time, Balak increased, increased the, moment, uh, the financial rewards. Put more gold, put more, more natural blessings. Uh, he sent princes more numerous, more honorable. And then they said, uh, they tried to appeal to his greed. His greed. And then uh, they came and says, Balak, uh, no, we, we, we come. they came to Balaam again. Verse 16, and uh, saying all this thing. Then Balaam said in verse 18, Though Balak to give, were to give me his house full of silver and gold, 
I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Please stay tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say. Now the Lord already says, don't you go. Then here they come back again and they say, look, they open his eyes, all turn green, dollar signs, and gold, or whatever color. And one of the strange things, I don't know why the Chinese likes it. Chinese, the Chinese, uh, I mean in the natural, they seem to like gold, right? So when they come up with a, with a gold colored iPhone or whatever, it was for the Chinese market. <laughs> right? So they like gold. But I don't, the Indians also like gold, I don't remember. Yeah, the, the color. But in a sense, actually, it's a color very hard to match. And, uh, and if you look at all the old movies, you notice know, all yellow, 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 all gold color. Well, very hard to match. You know? I don't actually like all the color of gold. Yeah. The only goldish color I like is the glory of God that is slightly tinged with gold. And, uh, and so, uh, gold color, not the best color uh, to me. Uh, the pure crystal, crystal, shiny light, uh, that's different. But anyway, uh, they brought all this gold and he asked the Lord and uh, that night, that night in verse 20, the Lord said, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, you shall do. Then Balaam rose in the morning and he went with them. He went with them. Uh, here's the thing. Verse 22. The Lord's, God's anger aroused against Balaam. And there was an angel of the Lord already with a sword to kill him. You all know the story. And in that story, the only one with open vision was the donkey. The human, no open vision. The donkey of which Balaam was riding on looked up and saw this angel. Balaam looked up and saw nothing. The prophet saw nothing, the donkey saw something. <laughs> Sometimes better to trust the donkey than the false prophet. Right. So, and then the donkey very kind donkey. When the donkey in verse 23 saw the angel of the Lord, the donkey, you know, here's the road, they're traveling on the road. The donkey turned and went into the field. So you can imagine, poor Balaam go, hey, where are you going? You know, take him down to the field, muddy field. And of course, Balaam was very upset. He didn't see the angel. He only thought the donkey was behaving very strangely that day. Uh, actually, the donkey saved his life first time. So, Balaam beat the donkey. Get back! Get back! Poor donkey. Right? Beaten, maybe almost blue and black. Until the donkey, you know, saw it was safe, go back to the road again. And... And... After the donkey went back to the road, they continued along the road. And then in verse 24, the angel of the Lord stood further up in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. So the donkey, this time the angel very clever. Angel, of course the angel very clever. <laughs> Before that the angel stood on the road, the donkey could escape go to the field. So the angel looked for another place where the road narrowed two walls. Ha! Oh, angel stood there. This donkey with open vision, very clever donkey. So this donkey, when he saw the angel, he go to one side. Then he saw the sword there. <laughs> and as he, as he go forward, Balaam's leg got stuck. Ah! Ah, oh, you stupid donkey! Ah, ah. He didn't know his life was safe because 
in the natural, he see this big open space and the dog came purposely with one his leg on the wall. Say, <laughs> what is the donkey doing? So, again the poor donkey got bitten several times. And he struck the donkey. <laughs> poor, poor donkey. You know, same is like second time of beating. So the next time you save somebody's life, you're good to somebody, they give you a beating, you have to complain, don't. Even the donkey didn't complain. <laughs> so, this, this donkey saved his life on a narrow passage, and then the angel saw that the donkey escaped. And uh, then the angel went further still. And this time, it was so, so narrow, no place to go. <laughs> cannot go left, cannot go right. You know what the donkey did? The donkey go, oh, don't want to move. The donkey refused to move. The donkey just lay down. Boom. <laughs> and Bella said, what kind of donkey is this? Get up! And then he beat the donkey. When he beat the donkey, and this time Balaam was angry. Then this donkey, open vision not enough, open mouth, <laughs> speak human language. And uh, I like the old King James. In the old King James, the donkey opened his mouth and said, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And the old King James, uh, Balaam says, Nay, because you have abused me. So the donkey spoke in, in English. Balaam said, Nay, he gave a donkey. <laughs> and then, because you have abused me, I wish there was a sword I could kill you now. Oh, poor donkey. Then he got killed for saving his life three times. And then the donkey, very clever donkey also. So not only the donkey got open vision, donkey got open mouth to be able to speak human language. Donkey got clever brain. He reasoned. He did. And that's where he's, he says, Am I not the donkey you have ridden ever since I became yours on the first day? Have I ever done this to you? And that's what the old King James said, Nay. <laughs> and verse 31, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel already. Then he realized the donkey did him a favor. Today, Balaam is in hell and the donkey is in heaven. <laughs> Animal paradise. <anyway. laughs> So, nice donkey. Hey, by the way, I've seen a donkey in, uh, in, in, in Animal Children's Paradise. And, uh, so, uh, the next time I go to Heaven Children's Paradise, I to see this donkey. I've yeah, got a long story to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> My question to you is this. The first time God says, don't you go. Second time God says, you can go and follow them, but only do what I say. Say what I tell you to say, nothing more. But after the second time, since God Himself said you can go, then why is God angry and putting the angel to kill him? Doesn't God contradict Himself? Right? God, God just told him, the second time that Balaam asked, should I go with them? I mean, and then God says, Go, but only speak what I speak. What I let you speak. He just said, Go, and then there was an angel there that wanted to kill him because he went. Now, for you to answer, Why did God put the angel there to kill him when God just said you can go but you will only say what I said? Let's go for the money, then he will speak what God said. Okay, he go for the money. Yes. He go but he didn't go for God, he still go for the money. Yes, then he will speak what God said. Uh, he didn't speak anything yet. But God knows his intention, God knows his heart. Ah, so Benaya, you're getting very clever. Excuse me, I 
Okay. 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 When he was going, see everything is in a heart and in a mind. When he went, he was his heart was not right. When he went, his heart was still secretly hoping he can curse them. He can curse them. And God put an angel there because God knows his intention. See, that's the part on the point intention sometimes we hear God's word we seem to obey but our obedience got different intention and this is the thing I have found about God he acts even based on what is in your heart and your mind when your action hasn't come up yet I can prove it in the Bible but from Genesis 6 he already acted even when man's imagination was wrong. God doesn't always wait till the action finish. God acts even before He comes. Something He acts very far in advance. Remember what He told the Joshua generation when they are about to go in. Moses says, I know what is in your yetzer. God said, I see their yetzer that in several generations they will turn against me. God saw the imagination so deep that in the first generation they'll be alright. Second generation they start going astray. Third generation going astray. By fourth generation they are rebelling. God said, I can see it. And he told Moses, I want you to, to teach you a song and I want you to teach this song to them so that they will pass this song down the generation when they sing, they will remember that God has said it so that they will come back to God. God is so good. He acts based on intention. And in the story of the old prophet, young prophet in the book of Judges, uh, in the beginning of the book of 1 Kings, when King Jeroboam had, uh, had broken up from uh, Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son, and took ten tribes with him, he built a false altar. At the building of the false altar, God sent a young prophet. And the young prophet prophesied, but then God told the young prophet, you must not eat or drink until you get back and go by a different way. The old prophet came to try to deceive him, to eat and drink in his house. As the young, before even the young prophet met the old prophet, while he was going, remember in the end, a lion came and killed the young prophet. That's a story in the book of Judges. And the thing about this is, in the visions, when the young prophet haven't even met the old prophet, in his heart, he was thinking of, ah, going to relax. And remember, God says, you must come out of the country before you can eat and drink. He's really thinking, ah, job over, I don't want to relax already. When it's actually not finished, when he was even thinking about that, thinking about that, before the old prophet came and deceived him, the lion that was to kill him was stirred. That very moment. That is why Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians 10, the battleground is in your thoughts. And Jesus said thoughts proceed from the heart also, not just from the mind. There are thoughts that are in your mind, there are thoughts that are in your heart. The one in your heart is actually deeper. And Paul says, this is spiritual war. It all revolves around the intention of the heart and the thoughts of the heart. If you intend to do the right thing, God will really start blessing you. You intend to do the wrong thing, things will really start changing. That's how... That's how fast the spiritual world we are. That's why I said that in the spiritual world, thoughts equal actions. We don't realize it because we're in the natural world so much. But in the spiritual world, thoughts equals actions. Thoughts in the heart, thoughts in the mind. 
We have to guard our thoughts. Guard our mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let me turn to that. Close this part and then open for questions. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to wrap this part about the throne room. When you deal with throne room area, you're dealing with your heart and mind. Blessed are the pure and heart for they shall see God. That nothing to do with the gift of the Holy Spirit. If your heart is pure, if man or woman remain in the purity of heart from the day you were born to the day you grew up, you would have visions of God. And then when you talking about the negative thing, talking about positive thing now, when you just believe with a simple heart, it opens more things for you. Everything has to do with the heart, but let me quickly read 2 Corinthians 10 first. And it says here, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 3 to 6, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Notice the word. Not just one or two thoughts, every single thought. And the context is spiritual warfare. Every thought. And thoughts proceed out of the heart, thoughts proceed from our mind. In the book of John, chapter 1. Is a positive side. And uh, Jesus, when he began to recruit his disciples, <coughs> one day he came to uh, he came to Galilee in verse 43, John chapter 1, verse 43. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. And then verse 44. 44 Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him. They were excited because they found the Messiah. We have found him. Of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then, while Philip and Nathaniel were talking, Jesus was not present. Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And so finally, Nathaniel came with Philip to Jesus. And without one word spoken by Nathaniel, it was 47, when Jesus saw Nathaniel, Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Well, he saw him, x-ray him, saw his heart. He saw his heart. Then Nathaniel, in verse 48, says, How do you know me? And then Jesus gave him a word of knowledge. Before Philip called you while you were under the fig tree, I saw him. He was stunned. Nobody knew he was under the fig tree. Nobody heard the conversation between him and Philip. But Jesus knew everything. And so, just those little bit of word knowledge, he believed. And he says, in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Now, this is way before Matthew 16, when they say, you are Christ the Son of the living God. Nathaniel was the first one to confess. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Because that is the way the Jewish recognize the Messiah. The coming king. Now, his heart believed. His heart was without deceit. The way simple, childlike faith. You know, he immediately got blessed. Immediately, Jesus said, verse 30, verse 50, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than this. And he said, Most assuredly, when Jesus said that, it's surely, surely. Actually, the Greek word is Amen, Amen. I say to you, Hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He hasn't got all these things yet. But he already got this blessing. You know why? It's the law of intentions and heart. I give you the bad guy, I give you the good guy. And there are many other stories. But I show that your heart's intention, God is watching. 
whatever your heart's intention. And then we solve the mystery of why God opposed. He could have gone with a good heart. You see, this is different. If he had gone with a heart, he said, I must obey God. I must obey God. I must not be tempted by all these things. The angel would not oppose him. But there was a change in his heart. He was still trying to find a way to do the wrong thing. God heard him. Your thoughts are louder than your words in the spiritual world. Your intentions scream with a loud voice. You cannot hide. Thus, it is important when we talk about the true room. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is good to have a simple, innocent, or childlike heart. Not a crafty heart, crafty mind. Simple heart. God says it. And especially if it's the word. Just like Mary. You know Mary, when the angel appeared, Mary said, how can these things be? And then he spoke, the angel, Gabriel spoke all the things. He says, let it be unto me according to your word. Oh, so simple. So simple. And don't forget, that is some of the most fantastic pronunciation. Because Gabriel says, you will have a child. And Mary says, how? I, I don't know any person. And he says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And that which is in thee shall be called the Son of God. This holy thing that is there. Mary says, Let it be unto me according to your word. After she was speaking to an angel. And in the end, she was already engaged to Joseph. Joseph actually found it hard to believe. Because in the story in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, Joseph was still thinking how to put her away. I mean, how to believe this fiancé of yours say, virgin birth. <laughs> Correct? In a human way, it had never be, it happened before and it will never happen again, by the way. <laughs> so don't anyone come and claim some virgin birth. <laughs> it's not of God. How to believe? Simple faith. So what? Uh, what Matthew think? Uh, uh, this Joseph thinking in the because of Matthew. Well, how can I love her still? But I don't believe. I find it hard to believe. This is against all the natural laws that he knew. And then in, in the end, while well, he thinking of how to put her away quietly, so as not to shame her, the angel had to appear in a dream. So he thinking, 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 and then he fall asleep. Then the angel says. Now basically the message was, don't, don't worry, this is of God. And he woke up, he said, oh, alright. <laughs> but the fact is, Mary's faith is so simple. Joseph's faith needs a bit of undoing. Too much thinking, 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 thinking. When God is moving, it's just simplicity. Now, uh, we have closed this series on throne rooms. If we start the new series in two weeks time, we come back. Signs and wonders series. You realize the operating signs and wonders. God promised three signs and wonders that are coming here. I know 100% they will come. I've already started visiting some people preparing them. And I also know that it has to come at a certain time after the altar building in USA. And then next year, move, we plant the church in uh, USA, February the 9th. And we move into a different episode. But basically, the most sophisticated signs and wonders, based on one simple thing. God says, we believe in her God. That's it. No questions asked. The only thing we do is, we fast and pray, make sure that we do exactly what. And there are certain things God did instruct. That when we call healing services, that it will be at a time and place when the Archangel Phanuel and the Spirit being who worked with Jesus, uh, you got to my uh, help, the same one that energized the uh, works of Jesus, will be present in a meeting. And their words to us is this these are the exact words. What was permitted, what was not permitted before is now permitted. What was not allowed is now allowed. 
they mean that they are actually supposed to come during the second uh, second cycle of seven years, 2020 onwards. But when we call the healing services according to their direction in less time, let's say once a month, only that once a month they are allowed to come and be present. And they already show us visions of these three signs that are coming. And I saw a few others that are coming, other visions that are coming. And we know, we believe, we flow along, and then we just step aside, let God do his signs at one time. See, it's very simple. And that's why it has to come down to simplicity of heart. That as long as we have a pure heart, I, I'm giving a little bit of advanced teaching on signs and wonders. Eh? But I said, give finish the point here. <laughs> <laughs> the key to signs and wonders is this. It's not the sign in itself, not the miracle. You know what the actual key is? The confidence that you have heard God. If you knew that God told you to go to a certain HDB apartment where somebody just died three hours ago, and God says, go there and raise him from the dead. The problem is not raising him from the dead. The problem is not how long he has died. The problem is not how many unbelievers are there. The problem is this. Did you really hear God? Can you see that? You see, you can see where the problem is. The whole issue is whether you have heard God correctly. See, when you go there, then there might be 10 atheists staring you in the face. That might, God might, uh, the devil might put a few Pharisees also there. And then, uh, and then the family might have started the funeral service. And they really started crying. And the coffin also. Undertaker, plot, all that, crematorium, all book. All those things don't stop you. As long as you knew that you heard the Lord. See how simple it is? And you not even worry about how to raise him from the dead. Should you shout very loudly from the bottom of the HDB? Anyway, most of the funeral service are at the bottom of the HDB. <laughs> and say, Lazarus, arise! Okay. Tana bang! Arise! No? Or should you go very softly like Peter did in the book Acts chapter 12 and say, Abita, arise. That one secondary. The main thing is, do you hear God? Because the methodology, if one didn't work, you keep doing until it work. But actually, if you really hear God, you will know exactly what to do. But the main thing is, did He hear the Lord? And if He did, the whole thing rests on this. Your confidence in what the Lord said. Faith is very simple, correct? So whether it be growing a new arm or leg, or healing of a tiny little flu, it is whether you heard the Lord. And you're confident you heard the Lord. And you're confident you heard the Lord, the Lord will back you up. Signs and wonders in its pure simplicity is faith in the spoken word. Faith in the spoken word. Now, sometimes people miss it. They thought they hear God. They didn't hear God. But if you really hear God and you obey God, then the Bible miracles are easy. You know why? All Bible miracles are based on people hearing God. Even Moses, sometimes he didn't know what to do. Do you know that up to the day he parted the Red Sea, he still didn't know what to do? He was crying to God. Lord, help your people. God, help your people. Egyptian army behind, mountains on one side, racing on one side. And then God has to ask him, What do you have in your hand? See, God has to teach him. So even up to the last week, he knew God was going to deliver them, that 100%. He knew God was going to, God was going to keep his promise. But he probably didn't realize God was going to do this great thing. Under the very day, God says, What's the 
in your hand. And then when God told him to raise it up, he raised the rod. The wind started to blow. And the whole night, supernatural things start happening. The Red Sea started parting. It is all whether you can hear God's voice. Signs and wonders very simple. So when we enter the period of signs and wonders, you know, don't get so, oh, great miracle. Oh. And then when you come in, and then a miracle started, and then I be my signs and wonders. No, the miracles, the, the, the miraculous thing is this. When I am preaching somewhere, let's say in Australia, US, and Benaya is in charge. And then you come into the church and you see a long line of wheelchairs because they heard about the miracles. But those miracles took place when I was here. And now I'm not here. And then you look at the long line and you say, Oh, we better hear God this morning. <laughs> but the miraculous thing is, you are all going to hear God. And you're going to know what God wants to do. And when you know what God wants to do, it makes it so easy. What makes it hard is we don't know what God wants to do, or we cannot hear Him. The same way, as you come back to the throne room series, you have a preview of the Saints and Mother series. Now we pull back to the throne room series. The whole thing revolves around your heart and your mind. It's the heart and mind that blocks us from hearing God. A heart that is not loving or worshipful. A mind is unrenewed. Now you turn the opposite. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. A mind that is the mind of Christ. A heart that is Matthew 5 verse 8 pure. Beautiful. God can use it. Signs and wonders. So the simplicity of these secrets to remain in the throne room. Although we teach you explain, explain, but in the end it comes to the simplicity of a childlike walk with God. Child I think. And at the end of the day, you will be Luke chapter 17. We are just unprofitable servants doing the master's bidding. That is great faith. We did it because the master says he wants to do it. We just created the atmosphere for the master to work. All glory, praise, and worship unto him. Praise God. So now some of the questions might be coming in. Uh, Eddie, you have those things. So we are closing this uh, throne room series uh, with some questions and answers that you might have. And at the end of the series, we have a bit of that to allow people to wrap up the understanding of what the throne room series is. And in case it raises up some question. So any questions from the floor? And then some, I think, are from online on the throne room series. Okay, no questions, we close shop and go home. Oh, or rather, you know, kind of third service. <laughs> But uh, any questions on the throne room or being the presence of God that you want to ask? Any questions are? Throne room series, no questions? Anybody? Uh, there's a question floating for you. Ah, uh, can you get the thing so they can hear you on the microphone? Actually, this morning you share about, uh, uh, this is a statement, something sounds like this. Many people claim that it is a throne room, but however, actually, they are praying at the full school of God. Would you please elaborate more on this? Okay. So, in the book of, uh, so the question, I'm sure you all heard it, many people claim to be at the throne room when they are actually praying at the full stool. In the book of Revelations, chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. After these things I looked, behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, come up here, I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Then he described the throne room. That's chapter 4, correct? Now, look at chapter 1. Chapter 1. 
In chapter 1, John says, uh, in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, similar thing, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see right in the book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, the Ephesus, to Smyrna, the Pergamos, the Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to the Odyssea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands. The, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. And then he described what the Son of Man is like. Here's my question. My question is the answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difference between chapter 1 and chapter 4? What is the difference between chapter 1 and chapter 4? Right? Both sides you see vision. He talk with Jesus. What's the difference between the two? One, uh, you like me to answer that question too? Okay. <laughs> Are you going to answer that question for me? No. Okay, right. The difference is in chapter 1, he saw a vision which was from the throne room, projected to the earth. Now Jesus is still standing in the throne room. But he was not in the throne room. He was having a vision of the throne room, of Jesus standing in the midst of the lampstand, because when he go on, he saw the same thing. But he was having a vision of the throne room projected to him while he was in the body. In chapter 4, he was taken up phew, into the spirit world itself. And that's the difference. One is having visions of the throne room while you're on earth. Of course, every time you pray, you're praying to the throne room, correct? Where else do we pray to? Like face Jerusalem or face you know, China or face uh, Antarctica. Right? When you're praying, you're praying to God the Father. So you are facing the throne room. Uh, you are on the earth and your prayers are still heard in the throne room. You might even have visions of different parts of the throne room. You might even have visions of God sitting on the throne. But it's you seeing the throne room, but not at the throne room. Then in chapter 4, he was taken to the throne room. Two different things. And let me tell you a few different from the experiential side. Number one, the level of God's presence and holiness was different. Was different. Uh, I know because when your spirit is taken to be there, your spirit cannot go there unless it's clean of certain things. Clean of certain worldliness. Which is why a lot of people see the vision, but they are not up there experiencing it because too much weight. The weights that pull them down. Too much worldly things pull them. Not to say, and we're not talking about sin or anything, we're talking about weights that beset us. Just too much worry about this world. Too much concern about this world. Uh, this world dominates the thinking and the heart too much. And so, uh, and, and God didn't pull you up, although He could, and not in any way, because you will feel very uncomfortable there. So He leaves you there and He comes to you. The other, He brings you up to Him. The level of presence is different. The level of energy is different. The level of holiness is different. And the interaction is different. Now, let me illustrate with something different. For example, sometimes in the spirit, like when I was doing reconnaissance for the altar <coughs> building, my spirit is taken to look at where to build the altar. And so I could feel my spirit moving there and like floating above the city and under the energizing of the angels. And uh, it's not extra traveling, please. You don't project yourself. It's just like you yield to God and ask God to show. And God got two ways to show you. Either you go or He can bring the picture to you. There's two ways to do it. And I got a little puzzle for you to solve. Wow, question got puzzled. Yes. In the book of 2 Kings, 
when Naaman came for healing from leprosy and Elisha healed him then as Naaman was about to go Gehazi the greedy servant ran after him and was greedy for money and tried to ask for something telling a lie then when he hid all those things and uh, then he innocently tried to you not know, pretend to be innocent and come back to Elisha and Elisha says Gehazi where have you been that's it and Gehazi told a lie that he hasn't been anywhere and Elisha made this statement and there are two translations for it you know old King James it says did not my spirit go with you when you followed Naaman and he turned back in the new King James it says did not my heart go with you when you went after Naaman and he turned back now here's a little puzzle for you to solve did Elisha came out of his spirit to see what was going on that means in spirit he was watching the whole thing or was the whole thing brought by video conference <laughs> to Elisha as he sat wherever in the home or, or, or cave or wherever he was and he saw the whole thing going on which took place smart one now we got two smart ones a smart Alex and a smart Benaya still thinking okay anybody else hey clue, clue uh, inside the Bible itself in uh, second Kings second Kings because that helps you answer also on the vision question Second Kings and uh, happens uh, in chapter five. Second Kings chapter five. It says in verse twenty six, did not my in this new King James so it says, did not my heart go with you when a man turned back from his chariot to meet you? And O King James says, Did not my spirit go with you? 2 Kings 5 26. The answer is that. Spirit. Eh? Spirit. His spirit went? Yes. Anybody else? Any other clue? Okay, the clue is in the word spirit or heart. If you check in the Hebrew in verse 26, the word spirit is the word lap, L-E-P. And if you study the Hebrew, the word lap is a very common word like kadia in the Greek, which talks about the heart. So the, the New King James did translate it correctly when they replaced the word spirit with heart. Based on the old translation, it would have been Elijah's actual spirit come up based on the actual Hebrew word is actually his there and his heart can see all those things so it is like a video projection to him so you can see okay now there is a certain ability you have in the spirit that you might not have known until your spirit developed remember I got I got one teaching on the qualities of your spirit man spirit man is not limited by geography Spirit man is not limited by time. It can go to past, present, future. And the qualities of spirit. That uh, in the spirit world, if you grow in the spirit, like right, right now, if I want to, and, and under the permission of God, if I want to see what's going on, let's say if, uh, if let's say we have a church in Sydney. So to see what's happening in Sydney, they don't have a church today. But as I, I think about the word church, just my thought about the word just might quicken my heart. And if I'm a very visual person, that is my imagination and the part of my eyes, spiritual eyes are very open. Because things in the spirit also got the five different dimensions. In the natural, if you're fully uh, healthy, you will have your eyesight, your hearing, your smell, your taste, your touch, all functioning. In the spirit, we also got these five senses. 
you can see spiritually, you can hear spiritually, he that has, ear, he has an ear let him hear what my spirit is saying. So you can hear spiritually, see spiritually, and you can touch spiritually, you can smell spiritually. Uh, Paul, the, uh, Paul says, how did Paul know that it was a sweet smelling offering? Right? He talked about it in him. So the fragrance of Christ he talked about. And you can uh, touch, you can taste, both taste and see that the Lord is good. So there are five sensations also. And so, if all your spiritual man is developed and healthy, the moment you think about anything, all your five spiritual senses are at work. So, let's say if I think about the church in Sydney or in prayer, uh, right now, straight away, I am at Sebastian's house because one of the leader. So, I can see, you know, okay, he's busy about doing something. He's at the moment not praying, right? So, uh, but I didn't go there. The heart can see. And uh, so, interesting, isn't it? The, the, that the heart can take projections or any place. It just like, you know, with a phone, now this video phone, right? In the internet, you can see anything. Uh, depend on what you want to see. And so, the same way. Uh, so, that answers back to your question that sometimes on earth we can see things in the spirit, which is different from you actually taken. In the vision I described uh, of Arian's vision this morning, first service, he was actually taken up. You could feel. A few times I know when I'm, sometimes you, you, you're not sure, like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, you don't know. It was too engrossed. But sometimes you know when you're taken. And you're taken out of, the, of your body. And, and your spirit has come out uh, to some place somewhere. Praise the Lord. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, oh, there's one here. Okay. As long as there's a light, it's on. Oh. Hi, Pastor. I'm just teaching the video. I'm going to be at the front room. I'm um, teaching uh, more about how, how love is important on our side for to have more experience. Or how important love is to have more experience. Uh, in terms of uh, being at the front room and that grain of love and how it relates to the experience. Okay, okay. So there is more uh, comment that to share more about the area of love and how important love is when you are at the throne room. Because the book of John, 1 John says God is love. Which is why one of my teachings is, if you want to know the presence of God, you might not have any visions, you might not have any gifting, you might not have anything. Just grow in love. Because if God is love, like First John says, the nearer your heart is to love, the nearer you are to God. The further you are from God, then the further you are from the concept of love. So just becoming a loving person, actually, the agape love of God, of course, will bring you nearer to God. Then you have scriptures like, uh, because God is love. So the throne room is the essence of love love itself and, uh, and love changes you when you're in the presence of love it does make you more loving it changes you in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 it says that faith is works by love in the Greek it says faith is energized by love and the word energized actually can be translated as energize the word energize is translated work Galatians 5 or 6. Faith works by love. And we know how important faith is. Faith is involved when you believe a thought that God spoke to you is God. Faith is involved when you see an imagination or vision and you have to believe that this is God. Faith is the operator of all things. Without faith, you cannot please God. Hebrews 11, 6. And faith is everything. In fact, in, at the end of the day, it has to do with faith. What is faith? Romans chapter 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is the ability to believe God's word. Without the ability to interact with God's word, everything else collapses. So the part of our faith is important. It is faith that helps us interact with the written word, the spoken word. The simplicity of it is faith. The Bible says in Galatians 5, chapter, chapter 5 or 6, that faith is actually energized by love. Which means that if you don't have enough love, 
faith collapse. Faith doesn't have enough energy. Uh, that is why when some people, when they see certain things or the Lord reveals certain things, their faith doesn't catch it because they don't have much energy from love. That's why love is at the base of everything. It's the base of faith. It's the energizing. Uh, love is the petrol that runs the faith engine. You can have a beautiful engine, no petrol, useless. It is the oil of love that the engine can run. And uh, so the more we we allow the love of God to change us, and true true love of God empties ourselves of self. The only way for us to stop thinking about ourselves is to start thinking about God and others. If you try to stop thinking about yourself, that is doesn't work. Like I tell you, you know, try you know, try not to think of anything. You will still think of something. <laughs> the only time you stop thinking about other things is say, now think about a dog. And then straight away you're thinking about dogs, you stop thinking about cats. So the only way to stop thinking wrong thoughts is to turn and turn think the right thoughts. And the same way that the only way to be less selfish is to love others. To be concerned for others. And to concern for the things of God. Uh, that is why when you really love God, you're concerned only for Him. That means you're not concerned even for yourself. Even if you're without food, clothing, shelter, and you're half dead, dying, also, never mind, Lord, as long as I still love you. That attitude God loves. Then He can work straight through you. But the consciousness of self can only disappear when love comes. That is why pure love removes self. And back to the same commandment love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus gave us a, a commandment. He says, to love one another as He loved us. You know why He gave us that? That is the way we become unselfish. By taking care of others, then we automatically become selfless. So, it all ties to faith. It's because it's all tied to faith, and faith tied to hearing God, that's why love is important. Yes. These are from the internet. How does one reach and maintain the pure heart level? Good question. Answer is found in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Hebrews 4 verse 12. And it says that the word of God is living, which is from the word Zoe, full of life. And the word of God is living and is powerful, from the word energizing. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It can cut between spirit and soul, bone and marrow. And so we know that the word of God is the ability to separate all your thoughts. So you can, in order to keep something clean, you must know what is not clean. Only the Word can show you what is not clean. And the Word of God in Hebrews 4.12 discerns the thoughts and even the intentions of the heart. Remember I talk about intention? Only the Word can check our intention. And it cuts it. Also John chapter 15, verse 3. My word has made you clean. And that word is directly tied to Matthew 5 verse 8. Because in Matthew 5 verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The word pure is from the Greek word katarizo. So he's saying, Blessed are the katarizo, for they shall see God. Then in John 15 verse 3, My word, which is actually logos, my logos has made you clean. You know the word clean in John 15 verse 3 is katarizo. He says, my word has made you katarizo. So when you link those two verses together, the solution is the word. Only the word and abundance of the word can retain pure heart. And I end this question with this illustration. You know why Jesus cleaned the disciples' feet? Okay, one of your common answer is for humility, correct? He had to show that he's a servant to them and that he teach them to serve one another. Remember Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But then he made a statement in the Gospel of John. He says that uh, 
he that is clean does not need to wash except for the feet. Because Peter was a very funny guy. Uh, but in the Bible, it doesn't seem that funny. But his answers are very funny. Because when Jesus came to clean his feet, you remember what his first word was? No, no, before that, he said, No, 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 no you, cannot, you cannot do this to me. He actually refused. And then Jesus made this statement. If, if, you know, if you don't allow this, you have no part in me. Then he opposite. Oh, no part. <laughs> hey, hey, clean me all over. No, 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 I want you. He's a very funny guy. Perhaps he's the joker inside the whole thing. And no, cannot be. Because otherwise, joker would be the head of the church there. <laughs> I know. But then, when he said that, Jesus replied, He that is clean or washed, doesn't need to be washed except for the feet. And then Jesus said, What I do to you, do likewise. Why only feet? Because the feet is the part of you that contact the earth. In those days, they don't wear boots or shoes that much, they wear sandals. And it's customary, and you know, we Asians know that in societies where you've got slippers, you need to wash your feet. Get dusty all the time. The dust gets on them. That was a reality. So when they go to a house, sometimes they've got a place to wash your feet before you go in. I don't suddenly you dirty the whole house. And your feet contacts the earth. The dust of the earth cling to. No matter how spiritual you are, you just have to spend one week shopping, 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 doing nothing without the word. You become a worldly already. The world clings to you. The world clings, the dust clings to you. The thoughts of the world clings to you. And you need washing. What's the washing? Ephesians 5. Jesus cleans the church by the washing of the word. My word has made you clean. And so no matter how spiritual we are, you need daily washing. I don't know how many times a day each one of you bathe, but I know some people in Australia and some other colder country, they don't bathe but once a week. <laughs> Some people don't bathe at all. And, uh, but we, we are used to bathing at least once. I bathe at least twice a day. I can never go to bathe without bathing. Right? I just need to clean myself up. And so, uh, so I bathe twice a day. No. When did I reveal this secret to you? <laughs> it's not secret. So, <laughs> when you bathe once. But, uh, man, why do we bathe? Because you got sticky, dusty, and sweat, and all the stink cling to you, you could feel it. I could feel it sometimes. I could feel, you know, especially if you're in a dusty country, and uh, all the thing, and especially if you take the train, or uh, all the train smells on you. Uh, and uh, so, this is part of being in this world, although we're not of the world. You need daily baths. And the only thing that can remove the world is the word. So Jesus' story of washing feet is illustrated. Like every day you need the word. No matter how strong you are spiritually, how prayed up you are, every day we still need the word. Because the word brings us back to the heavenly perspective. You just absent a while from the word, you already become worldly. It's the natural cause of events. Pastor, I just I have one question. Yes. Uh, when Jesus said my words are spirit, what does it mean this word is spirit? Okay. That one is from John chapter 6, verse 63. Where Jesus says, My words are spirit and they are life. And uh, the Greek word actually says, My words are pneuma and they are zoe. And so Jesus was talking about <coughs> the content of his words. Every word. Remember, we talked about how important the words of Maui is. If it's important for us, can you imagine how important it was for Jesus? And uh, every word that Jesus speaks has to be in line with the word because he was the word, big flesh. And so he's talking about words are containers. And the devil's words, okay, now we got to illustrate with the other side. The devil's words, are they spirit and are they life? 
Can someone answer me? Someone? <laughs> I'm going to throw you back the question. The devil life, the devil life is life. So you have to destroy. Uh, okay, you, see, you need the definition a little bit. Yes. Close to it, any more definition? Okay. The devil's words are spirit and they are death. Because they produce death. They contain death. They contain fear, which is there are many qualities of death. So when the devil's words come, it produces fear. When the devil's words come, it produces fear, then death. But it's also spirit. Except it is from the other realm of the spirit. Now it's beginning to get the understanding. Words are containers. We humans speak words. And we human got another. I illustrate with the devil, let me illustrate with human. A human who is not spiritual, tons of words, right? Tons of words sometimes. But their words sometimes have no spirit and no life. Because their words are from the soul. It's empty words and empty sound. And because they don't have life, don't have life also. Now, we all have to be like Jesus. So that we are filled with spiritual life. When you speak your words of spiritual life, and your words are from your spirit and not from your soul. See, sometimes we humans, because we live in, in physical soul and spirit, sometimes we can speak a word from our soul. That's for example, uh, when you have a long day, uh, at the end of the long day, you went home and you say, I am tired. Now who said that? Your soul or your spirit? Soul, soul. Correct. So when your soul speak it, it doesn't have spirit life. Your soul speak it. And the secret is not saying, wow, well, cannot speak everything. Only spirit come out. <laughs> then when you dialogue with someone, not much conversation. <laughs> because we humans got this. The natural level and all that, they cannot talk about durian because durian is not in the spirit. <laughs> so, so, how do we converse about food? How do we discuss what to eat after that? Uh, but except today, no eating. Today, all fasting still. Second day of fast. Uh, and tomorrow is the third day. And, what? and you discuss what to eat on Tuesday. So, how to discuss what to eat when discussing what to eat is all natural. So, of course, we have to discuss some things in natural, something in the soul. Uh, but we learn the difference that sometimes the words can contain just natural things when you're discussing about durian how much spiritual knowledge is inside there <laughs> not much right and uh, then of course the, when you're discussing durian you think angels will be watching no they're not interested they just hang out among themselves right but when you start talking about things of the Lord they are interested because performance of the spiritual dimension angels are spirit uh, so, the human got this level, the devil got that level, Jesus, his words are spirit and their life. So, that means what it contains. Contains spirit and life. Praise God. Okay, the online people are asking questions now. In the throne room, what do the pillars uh, spoken about in Revelations do? I am assuming, uh, not the actual pillars, you're talking about God made you a pillar in the temple of God. I'm assuming that's a question. So, this question comes from the book of uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, among the promises of the overcomers. God says that if he that overcome, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. So, probably some of you, oh, go to heaven, God take you <laughs> and kiss you. <laughs> And then we are all there walking freely in heaven, all paradise, and we see, hey, why is that? What is the person there? Oh, he overcame and became a pillar <laughs> in the temple of God. So, it's actually, pillars means foundational people in a new heaven and a new earth. You could actually move about. It's not like your heart <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, now, the city, the Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. And notice the bride of Christ are people going and coming. And so, uh, pillars mean what it is in the book of Revelation as it does in the book of Galatians. 
In Galatians, Paul said that he perceived that Peter, that is Cephas, and James are pillars in the church. He used the word pillars. So he's talking about people who are key leaders. Uh, so the interpretation here is that you become a key leader that God uses, even in a spiritual dimension. That's a pillar. Uh, and so we can say, be a pillar, but not a caterpillar. <laughs> butterfly is fine. Caterpillar for some time, but grow into a butterfly. Alright. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 2 to 27, verse 37, it says, God says, He will give us a new heart, put a new spirit in us, put His spirit in us to cause us to walk in His statutes, keep His judgment. Can we pray to receive all three? In other words, a new heart, a new spirit, and put spirit in us. Yes. Because all those three are staggered process. There are three different processes. And if you want to know more about this process, Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. There is a difference between God put His laws in your heart and write them in your mind. And God put His laws in your mind and write them in your heart. Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 slightly different. And so this talks about uh, the different areas in which God is uh, renewing us and conforming our heart and our mind. So the question is, can we pray for all three? The answer is yes, because they are all different processes. Oh, we finished. Any more questions from the floor here? Yes. Uh, There are two, uh, um, in the Bible, there's two types of uh, uh, experiences in the room or the editions where one is they just see something and they write, so they write down, and there's another one where the person seeing interacts, uh, some are um, not interacting, some are interacting. Uh, can you explain more on that? They're talking about the whole Bible? I'm um, talking about, uh, uh, it was, I was in the Revelations, John saw. And then you just write down the Revelations 1, the later Revelations 4, there's some interaction, there's some interaction, or like he asks something. And there seems there's differences in interacting and non-interacting. Yes, okay, to shame on that. Uh, yes, in the book of Revelations, you notice at the beginning he just saw. Then later when he went in the spirit in Revelations 4, he not only see he interacted. And some of the interactions you can find also in the book of Revelation chapter 21 and 22 where he actually was, with the angel said, come, I will show you. And so it actually took him to different places. So there's this interaction uh, that is going on. And uh, so some of these interactions are not just in the spirit and soul, but could be uh, not with his body. His body might remain where he is. So his spirit was interacting uh, different things. And there are actually, if I can say, because we have uh, five different sense senses, that full interaction, you talk about 2D, 3D, ID. All right. So sometimes you see, but you don't hear anything, which is what some of you started with. You might see some lights needed. Or sometimes some of you hear something, but that's all. You thought you hear. Remember when, when Jesus gave thanks to the Father in the Gospel of John, and then a voice spoke, you know, that I have glorified it, and I will glorify, uh, glorify His name. Uh, when, when Jesus said to glorify the fa Father, Father glorify me in that glory. And then when the voice spoke, some heard, Jesus heard a voice, some heard it thunder, some say it thunder, some hear the thunder, they didn't hear the voice, some just didn't hear anything. So notice the different interaction. And so when you can interact, the sense of touch has come. And so it depends on the development of your five senses. If only one of your five senses, like some of you, Finding each person is different. Some begin by hearing, some begin by seeing, some begin by smelling. 
some people smell the incense or smell perfume or smell smell good certain things in the spiritual dimension and uh, some people might sense a sense of touch like heaviness or lightness that's very uh, a sense of touch uh, some sense a sense of taste uh, they can taste a certain sweetness uh, that is there so sometimes we have one dimension then as two of the senses develop is two dimensional three four in a full interaction is all five working all five of your spiritual senses working you could see you could hear and uh, all those and then even if they are working they got different degrees of working sometimes you're seeing blurry but hearing clearly and it depends on energizing as I say there are two energizing one if you're energized from the inside that's your inner inner vision then sometimes you're energized from the outside energized from the outside tend to be very clear but not much inner witness uh, sensation then the strongest is your energized on the inside and the outside so your five senses can be energized from two two ways inside and outside or just from the outside that means some spiritual thing is trying to come like i say i can switch off sometimes I, I, I you know you get tired of seeing all the time and you just uh, you just want to because the spiritual world is very fascinating and and there's no end to it so sometimes when i read the bible when i want to uh, uh, just uh, do my meditation I just sort of switch off don't pay attention it's part of switching off it's still there in the background but I don't pay attention to it for me switching off is like don't pay attention to it and just concentrate then even when you switch off not pay attention urgently God still can intrude in sometimes I notice they just still come in because it's an urgent message that God has and then at other times like, like I have a diary where I record some of the downloads some days I just love it even though there's a lot of things happening uh, because to me, you know, those uh, uh, you get used to it, and uh, and it's not like like um, uh, like I didn't record like yesterday. I spent uh, after all night prayer, went for a nap, and then got up and did some visitation, come back, and then straight away uh, I was just doing research, and I had to finalize all the places to build altars and the hotels to stay in, so that all the rest of you can you know do your bookings and everything. So I wanted to finish everything yesterday. I finished at 11 p.m. During the midst of all those things, I got interaction. So when I was doing research, I told you there's an angel. When I pulled up mountains in Ontario, so I was looking at the computer screen. Then I heard a voice on my right say, Mark McKay, this is the one. I didn't even bother to turn to look. So I didn't record those experiences down. But it's, it's your daily life. It's your interaction that is that. And so... Uh, once your five senses are open, the interaction can come at any time. And, uh, uh, so, it depends on how much of your spirit senses are working. But don't worry if one or two senses not working properly. Like in the early days, even Arion himself, when he was seen, and then Raghira Al from Australia came to visit him, and then he tried to see, but he couldn't see. And then Raghira Al said, don't worry about seeing me clearly yet. Just hear this message. See? And he wants you to get, main thing is to download, get a message. And uh, then later on, you can develop the seeing. Then sometimes if you're trying to see, if you're not careful, your soul trying to impose a message. That means, if, let's say if, you're, if, you, if Jesus appeared to you in your inner vision, your soul will try to impose a picture that you have of Jesus from your own picture. Upon the real Jesus. And uh, so you go to avoid, make sure your soul is at rest, not trying to do anything uh, during the downloads. And so we got to let the soul uh, be at a restful state. So there are different, up to five degrees of, uh, uh, five senses of interaction, and then there are different levels of interaction. Uh, and then it reverse into you. For example, sometimes you got a reaction and it doesn't affect your body. For me, my body is adapted to a certain level so when there's a reaction in the spirit I will seldom have my body vibrating uh, but once in a while I just enjoy you know and just pray and just let it flow but otherwise my body absorbs it uh, but for some people when a certain level of energizing your body just reacts and because the body lacks the word 
in this small word could be assimilated into your body. And in the book of Proverbs 3, they say the word can become flesh. And in the book of Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God can come into your marrow and your bone. It cuts the marrow and bone. That means it does something that your marrow is where your stem cells are produced. Uh, from your stem cells in your bone marrow, spreads to your body. So your body can become more closer to the word. The, in other words, your body is not just energized by biological food. Your body part of energizing is actually receiving from the word and the spirit. So then it can contain more of the spiritual energy of God. Why are some visions and dreams given as a metaphor? Okay. Metaphors are like parables. I have noticed one thing. Once you are able to see visions, and the law of seeing visions is this, you can only see what you want to see. You cannot see what you don't want to see. Plus, you are never allowed to see what is not involved with you. Which is why in the downloads of the Twelve, the Twelve Disciples, they only see things in the Twelve. Once in a while, they get a glimpse of the others. And then for the, uh, among the Thirties, they might see things regarding the Thirties, uh, involvement in that. And so, I notice that when you are able to see visions, uh, that some things God still cannot reveal the visions to you. And you wait till you are asleep. Let's say your conscious mind is uh, is is knocked out, because your emotions will get in the way of seeing the vision. So most of the time, God reveals in dreams the things that you cannot receive in visions because they're too personalized and too involved in your emotion. So the metaphors try to come out to bring your consciousness back to it. That's the one first thing. And uh, when we were dealing with people who have permanent open vision. So I, I was curious, how does a person with permanent vision dream dreams? After all, you got vision, you can talk to an angel, you can see all those things. Then I realized, when I analyze the dreams of this person, then I look at the dreams and say, ah, I understand. <coughs> because all the dreams about uh, his personal life that he cannot see and interact. Because too involved, too engrossed. Things that you're emotional, emotionally invested in. It prevents you from seeing clearly. And so then God gives metaphors and dreams to bring it to your conscious mind. The second thing is, God gives metaphors and dreams to bring a state of seeking in your life. When they ask Jesus, why do you speak in parables to, to the people? And here you are explaining the parables to us. And Jesus says, so that in hearing they may hear and not hear and uh, they may not understand. Why was Jesus doing that? Because the parables were to be the first point of entry. Jesus wanted to separate by his parables those who just hear and say, ah, good story. From those who, who say, I want to know more. I want to know the meaning. See, Jesus wanted to separate those who are interested from those who are not interested. He wanted to separate the spectators from the seekers. And the seekers will ask for more and seek him and follow him, then they get more. So in the Bible, parables are given to separate between the hungry for the Lord, not hungry for the Lord. Metaphors and dreams are sometimes given to cultivate seeking from you. In other words, especially if you don't want to seek, don't want to ask, then it stops there. It's the way God encourages us to seek more. So sometimes he gave clues and metaphors and parables unto us. And how come the donkey, okay, the donkey has come out again. This donkey very famous. Yeah. Must give him a name. How come the donkey can see an angel? <laughs> this is a funny question. While some born again Christians with the Holy Spirit in them can't see them. <laughs> Very good question. I will get the donkey to answer this question. <laughs> so, um, firstly, this donkey is very pure and very innocent. 
pure hearted. Right. I mean, he was beaten, still want to save his master. And then this donkey never tell lie. You notice, he told the truth. Since the day I've been with you, have I ever done this to you? <laughs> yeah, the donkey got good memory. So the donkey was telling the truth. And uh, so there's some innocence and purity. And I think the donkey was an illustration of the innocence and all that. And then, secondly, there's the innocence. Secondly, donkey was a good donkey. Do you know if the donkey keep walking, the donkey will live, but the bailer will die? So this donkey was selfless donkey. Wouldn't you agree that this donkey is more selfless than some Christians? I think Christians were very selfish. You know, if if a Christian was walking along the road, and you know, between saving his life and saving another life, some might save their life first. Forgetting that saving another life, God saved your life too. And this donkey was selfless. Selfless. He's not interested in himself. He actually interested in his master. Beaten, yet still, number three, loving. How many times a master beat him? Uh, until he's black and blue. But... I would say, if this donkey, if we can say uh, an, an animal can love, this was a very loving donkey. Saved his master's life three times. Selfless and loving. After, after one beating, the donkey said, don't care anymore. Right? Donkey said, oh, after beating blue and black, still save the master second time. Oh, no. So, there are some, what I said, Christian qualities in this donkey. Although it cannot be born again. So we can learn much from this donkey. And I think a lot of born, Christ, born again Christians, they are not honest. Not honest and sincere. And, uh, they say something with their mouth, but they do something behind your back. And they know who they seem to be. They are two-faced and uh, double-minded, but two-faced. In front of you, they are nice. Behind, they are actually stabbing you in the back. And they are doing things. So. Opposite only donkey. Number two, a lot of Christians are selfish. Number three, a lot of Christians are not, are, are looking for themselves and not loving at all. They love themselves, they don't love others. This donkey, he loved his master, protected his master, and in a sense almost gave his life for the master, you know, all the beatings. Praise God. So we end with the donkey, and uh, nothing here. Very good. Right. Alright, so remember this series is a Throne Room Series 1 and in the future we might have Throne Room Series 2 uh, we continue to enter into the presence of God and remain in the presence and learn that all your five spiritual senses can be open to interact with God but let it flow to you in God's time you cannot suddenly, it will grow Let's go to God in prayer Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you cause to flow upon our lives Feel us, O oh Father God, so that we know the fullness of your spirit, the fullness of your true root, and cause your people, Father, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, such that they are able to know the fullness of your spirit. As we grow from glory to glory and grace to grace, establish us in the mercies and in the grace of God. Cause us, Father God, that wisdom will come upon your people as they handle the matters of the Spirit. Let wisdom, Father, grow so that the knowledge of the spiritual dimension, the knowledge of the things of the Spirit, will be easily flowing upon each heart in this life. We give thanks to you, Father, for all that you do. We bless you minister unto your life, Lord. Thank you, Father, for all your mercies. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's all rise together.